I don't usually start seminars with a definition. I'm going to start with a definition. I looked this up in, the, uh, in some en uh, encyclopedia or something. Um, to quantize. To quantize is to apply a formulaic set of rules to a classical system in order to render it quantum mechanical, as in quantize the harmonic oscillator or quantize gravity. <laughs> also, I might add quantize string theory. Um, I think if you haven't noticed, I think in a sense we've moved past the era of quantizing gravity. I think we've moved into an era where hopefully we will see quantum mechanics and gravity as two twins sort of joined at the hip, really so closely related that we can't separate them. We can't divide it into classical gravity, which we then quantize, but some kind of thing which the two are so closely connected that we can't separate them. In fact, some sort of thing where the essence of gravity and the essence of quantum mechanics are the same essence. Okay, so what is the essence of gravity? We all know the essence of gravity is geometry and how it changes in, uh, with respect uh, to sources and so forth. What is the essence of quantum mechanics? Well, I think a lot of people would say that the essence of quantum mechanics is entanglement. We've entered an era now where we're beginning to think that geometry and entanglement are very, very closely connected. Juan has already explained the sense in which that uh, is partly true, or possibly true. But I would, um, I would phrase it in terms of a kind of a slogan that entanglement is the hooks, H-O-O-K-S, the hooks that hold space-time points together to form a smooth manifold. Sometimes, not all entanglements necessarily correspond to smooth geometries, but that smooth geometries are hooked together and held together by entanglement. That's the kind of message which um, Juan has been advocating, uh, that other people have been advocating, that I've bought into, and it is a new thought. It's a really new thought in which quantum mechanics and gravity are really, really joined at the hip in a way that's inseparable. Uh, if I were to have to stop right here, I would have said, I think I did my job. I've explained what, uh, what it is I want to explain. But um, the best example of this, I think, to date, is exactly what uh, Juan and I, basically Juan, called the ER equals EPR connection. And that is exactly what he, uh, what he described, how if we start, start on the right side, how we start with two black holes. Those two black holes might have been created independently by independent matter, and they're very distant black holes. Then they're just separate. They're far away from each other. The only way to go from the exterior of Bob's black hole to the exterior of Alice's black hole is to go, let's call it, around the outside, the long way, from here to Andromeda, or however far away it is, and it takes at least a million years, or whatever it is, to get to Andromeda. But if those black holes are either caused to be entangled, you can't entangle them unless you either bring them together and let them interact, or bring entangled matter and separate it and drop it into those black holes. But if in some way those black holes are entangled, maximally entangled, entangled into the thermal field double state, then according to the ER equals EPR principle, a new geometry grows. A new geometry, a wormhole, an Einstein-Rosen bridge, and the Einstein-Rosen bridge can be a robust geometry. As Juan said, Alice can jump into one end. If the Einstein-Rosen bridge is big enough, she might survive for a while. Bob can jump into the other end, and they can meet at the center for a sort of short, um, uh, whatever it is that Alice and Bob do when they get together. And uh, as Juan said, they won't last very long, but they might be happy for a short period of time. Yeah, so something really new. In fact, Alice can do something else. She can stay outside her black hole and send Bob a message, not so that Bob can get the message while he's outside the black hole, but so that Bob could just get the message as he jumps in and passes the horizon. That message could be a nice message. It could say, I love you, Bob. I send you flowers. 
or it could be a bomb that she drops in and explodes in Bob's face. It could be a firewall, in other words, that, uh, that Alice creates behind Bob's horizon. There's no way for Bob to know what Alice is going to do. And so Bob has no way of knowing really when he jumps in if he's going to meet a firewall or if he's going to meet roses, so to speak, or nothing, just absolutely nothing. Uh, so that's the setup, that's the situation. Now let me come to the AMPS paradox, the paradox of firewalls, which I do think is a very deep and important paradox. I don't think the answer is what AMPS said, but I think the paradox is deep and important, and whatever the answer is, I think it's going to be something very, very deep. Um, the problem that AMPS addressed is what happens when, uh, how do you make this thing go to the next uh, slide? Anybody know? I'll, I'll just try pushing every button, but I'm afraid I'll lose the whole button thing. On the right. Button on the right, okay, good. Yes, I think you've seen that one before too today. That's the Einstein-Rosen bridge that connects the black hole to its own radiation. Now, here was the puzzle. The puzzle is that every time the black hole emits a photon, one of those hooks, in particular, the hook that connects the exterior of the black hole to the interior of the black hole. You can call it entanglement. I'm just going to call it the hook that, uh, that the hook that hooks together two neighboring points, one inside, one outside the black hole, and holds the thing together. Uh, every time a photon is emitted, one of those hooks is broken, and the hook is replaced by a hook that connects the exterior of the black hole to a Hawking photon. When enough hooks are broken, guess what happens? The interior of the black hole gets unhooked, or at least this is what AMPS would have us believe. The interior of the black hole effectively gets unhooked from the exterior. There just aren't enough hooks left to hold it together, and anybody who jumps in, Alice or Bob, jumping into that black hole will encounter no interior because it's been unhooked. That's a poetic, or maybe not a poetic, a cartoon way of saying what the AMPS paradox is about. Okay, what is the solution? Basically, the solution that Juan and I proposed can be expressed, he, he, he said it in uh, some detail. I would, say it, I would say it the same way he said it, except I don't have to because he already said it. But I would say, look, in a certain sense, the, oh no, I, did, I knew I was going to do that. Yeah, okay. I was, right. Uh, in a certain sense, the interior of the black hole is so closely connected to the radiation that the hooks that connect the black hole to the radiation can actually be thought of as hooking the interior to the exterior. In other words, in a certain sense, in a sense that I think Juan doesn't like, and I don't either, but I'm going to say it, in a certain sense, the radiation is the interior of the black hole. And that's a proposal which uh, you can read about, you can study, you can try to figure out whether it makes any sense or not. But to put it short, that's the basic, uh, that's the basic hypothesis, that, uh, that the transfer of entanglement between the interior of the black hole to the radiation is really not that much of a transfer because really the distance between the interior and the radiation is not very big, at least through the wormhole. Okay, so that's the proposal. Now, the problem with this, it's not the problem with it, but a problem with it is it raises a new kind of firewall paradox. If it doesn't have to do with entanglement and it doesn't have to do with disrupting these hooks, there's a new way now of making a firewall. Namely, we could go back to the case of the two black holes, Alice throwing in a bomb and making a, uh, making a uh, firewall for Bob. Or we can just say in this case here that by Alice tampering with the radiation in some way, perhaps Alice can send a nasty message to Bob through this collection of wormholes. The question then becomes, how likely is it? How hard is it? How difficult is it for Alice at the end of those radiation little bubbles there? How hard is it 
to send a nasty message. I have five minutes, okay. A nasty message uh, to Bob. Um, here there is, what should I say, um, controversy. One description in one form or in one uh, description, namely the AMPS uh, uh, description, they would argue that almost any perturbation, the tiniest perturbation that you do on a single photon is somehow enough to send that very, very bad message. And there is a serious argument there. They prove a certain mathematical theorem, and the basic mathematical theorem says a certain commutator is not zero. That commutator can be interpreted as a causal commutator which sends a nasty message through the wormhole. Uh, for just one photon, on the other hand, with a different understanding of it, and I think it's the understanding, let's see, maybe I can, uh, yeah. Uh, with a different understanding of it, this is the ADS version of it. With the ADS version of it, it all depends on whether we think of the past half of the Penrose diagram as physical, or the past half of the Penrose diagram as just a fake, which is used to set up the initial state, the initial state being the thermal field double state. If you imagine that the past really exists, then it turns out to be really easy to send a bad message from the past to Bob and kill Bob up at the A up there, up at A up on the top. On the other hand, if you think of the past as a fiction only there for the purpose of setting up the initial state, then you have to ask, can Alice from the future reach back somehow and send that same firewall to Bob? And the answer, as far as we can tell, is yes, she can, but it's extremely difficult. It's about as hard as setting up an initial condition in a closed room of gas, which is guaranteed to create an inflow of the gas all into the corner of the room, not immediately, but 100,000 years from now. That is hard. It involves understanding chaos, not understanding, it involves defeating terrible chaos, terrible complexity, and so forth. And so if one believes that in this picture here, that the first half of the Penrose diagram is just a fiction for setting up the, uh, the initial state, then it becomes impossibly hard, or not impossibly hard, but incredibly hard to create that firewall. If you want to play the game that the past is part of the physical space that Alice actually sees, then it's easy to send the firewall. The question, of course, becomes, how do we think about the case of radiation? How does it couple to this? Is the radiation case, the case where the black hole collapses and radiates, is it more like the case where the past is fictitious, or is it more like the case where the past is real? I would say it's more like the case where the, where the past is fictitious for the simple reason that a black hole, when created by collapse, has a smooth horizon. It has a smooth, stable horizon, whereas if this system were created in the past, as we all know, creating things in the past in a black hole is an enormous instability, and that instability will create a uh, an unsmooth horizon. So my, my slogan is that black holes with smooth horizons stay smooth. And hopefully over the next five years, somebody much younger than me will be able to make some progress on this uh, and will be able to sort out whether there are firewalls or not. Um, I'm finished, That's, thank you very much. Do you think you have or would not construct a, a complete set of rules for what actions by Alice produce what mes me results for Bob? Or, or what would it take to produce such a set of rules? What would you need of a theory? I, I proposed a set of rules that based on an understanding of chaos and complexity. And, uh, but I, what I did promise um, uh, Andre is that I wouldn't talk about my last paper today. Mm -hmm. But in my last paper, I proposed a rule and the rule is exactly this kind of rule that if it, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, involving chaos and how hard it is to create um, 
uh, to invert uh, the flow of a chaotic system. Hard measurements were even part of the original Hawking paradox. You had to do a hard measurement to know whether the black hole, whether information is lost or not. So that doesn't by itself, um, you know, preclude it being relevant. Not talking about a hard. Uh, we're talking about the process of of sending the message, not measuring something. Just the process of sending the message. It is possible. I don't think I would deny that it's possible for Alice to send a nasty, uh, a nasty firewall through the wormhole. What I would say is it's hard. It's not the generic thing that you expect to happen for a freely um, uh, radiating uh, black hole. That, uh, so it's, I don't deny the possibility of doing something very hard. Any more questions? If not, then thank you, Lenny. You're welcome. And